Okay. My name is Orson J. Mock. I reside in Dallas, Texas. Uh, my name is Orson J. Mock. I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm a researcher. I work with uh, New Frontier Productions here in Dallas. We've been doing research on JFK since uh, 1968. Um, I work with Miss Allen, who was also an associate with Robert Groden. Did the film with, uh, was an associate or assistant director with uh, Oliver Stone on the movie JFK. Um, Where were you born? I was born here in Dallas. So you all your life? All my life. Um, it's home. How long have you been working with Miss Allen? Uh, well, I've been with Miss Allen probably uh, off and on over a period of probably about seven years. Do you enjoy what you do? Uh, well, I, I started, my third grade teacher was here the day that uh, President Kenny was assassinated and she, we were having to do a book report and she uh, basically uh, directed me and inspired me to start picking up information and, uh, on the assassination of JFK and different viewpoints. And that's where I started my research about when I was about nine years old. And I'm 41 now, so I've been doing it for 30 something years. Well, 20 something years anyway. So you actually remember the day that he was shot? Yes, sir. Can you tell me what, how you remember that day? Uh, well, actually what I was, I was in roughly about three years old at the time, but I still remember uh, the footage of the president being assassinated on television. And it was pretty, uh, pretty impressive because, I, like I say, I was, I was just three years old and I still remember it to this day. So it was imperative on what I thought and how I felt about the research I do now. So how much of it do you remember anyway? Uh, well, I remember uh, the news break uh, coming on where they were, it was showing the motorcade going by and then I actually, uh, the break in the news film and the Parkland hospital incidents and just basically the events of the day. Uh, what we basically do is uh, we receive uh, emails from all over the world, uh, foreign countries. Uh, actually, you wouldn't, you would, you really wouldn't believe it, the number of people that were here that day that didn't get statements taken from them, but just had basically eyewitness accounts of uh, the assassination that had just left the uh, area after the assassination because they didn't want to be involved. But people are more and more coming out with the things they had, like videotapes and. Uh, Eyewitness statements that we're recovering now, basically, uh, as time goes on, people are feeling more comfortable with the situation and, you know, they're not going to be killed or assassinated. Roughly uh, over 300, about 360 eyewitness statements were taken that day, and only two living eyewitnesses are left alive that gave statements. So you can understand their feeling for not wanting to come forward with the information and the pictures and the films that they had at the time due to the involvement of the government. Uh, Conspiracy all the way, in my opinion. So who do you think was behind the conspiracy? Who do I think was behind it? How do I think it laid out? Well, the night before, uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson, he had a mistress named Madeline Duncan Brown. They'd been together for over 21 years. They even had a son named Stephen. Uh, the night before, they were at uh, Jack Ruby's uh, club, the Majestic, down on uh, Main Street, and he came out and quoted to her that, quote unquote, after tomorrow, those G.D. Kennedys won't embarrass me anymore. She wrote and testified, and, or wrote her statements and her testimony in her book called uh, Texas Morning. We also uh, have worked hands-on with uh, Madeline before she died about two years ago, uh, acquiring all her information, uh, rights to her, her materials and everything so we could reproduce it. And um, then you have uh, your situation with uh, the FBI and the CIA and the Secret Service with J. Edgar Hoover. When JFK was brought in as president, he, uh, one of the first things he did was put his brother Bobby as Attorney General of the United States, quote unquote, for no other reason than to be uh, J. Edgar Hoover's boss. And that went over like a box of rocks, you know what I'm saying? Because Hoover had been in, in, put in office by uh, Calvin Coolidge back in the 20s. He had, 
He'd gone through Coolidge, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, all the way to JFK. He'd never had a boss. So all his illegal dealings with uh, organized crime figures, uh, different uh, illegal wiretaps, uh, the information he was uh, using to quote unquote blackmail people and different uh, po political figures across the United States to get his way at different things that he did has all begun to come to surface. And if you want to go a little further than that, uh, you can tie in your organized crime uh, as your third third man in the situation between the Giancano family out of Chicago and the Marcello family out of New Orleans. The reason we know this and we've come to find out the information over the past five or six years is that uh, the ties between LBJ and the Marcello family out of New Orleans. Uh, back in the 40s and the 50s, uh, LBJ was uh, trying to put together uh, the money to become governor of the state of Texas and to gain political power within the state. He had a, a gentleman by the name of Billy Sol Estes, which is known as the tech, king of the Texas wheelers and dealers. They were involved in numerous uh, fertilizer scams and everything else that had taken, you know, taken, robbed people of their money and uh, also had, had done business with the federal government and were taking uh, kickbacks and everything from the federal government at the same time. Mr. Estes is 78 years old now. I had breakfast with him about I guess about a week ago. He's coming out with a new book uh, that we're trying to get published right now and put out by August. And the name of that book is uh, I Know Who Killed JFK. When Billy was uh, getting ready to go to federal prison and do some, do some uh, jail time, he, did, he had a seven, eight year sentence looking him in the face. He, Bobby Kennedy came to him and he said he knew, he knew who killed his brother and he could, he could finger him, pinpoint him. But in, he wanted, in exchange, he wanted a uh, clemency, and he wanted to be uh, not prosecuted for any of his involvement in any any further crimes that would come out of the JFK assassination. And uh, Bobby couldn't do that because he didn't no longer have the power within the government since his brother had been assassinated. To well, they knew LBJ wasn't going to grant the immunity. You know what I'm saying? Even though it was his old business partner. Uh, it was better for him to go to prison and keep his mouth shut and come out of prison and uh, go, on, go on about his business, which he did for over 25 years. But he's in bad health now, and he's uh, about to die, and he's releasing his book. Hopefully, by August, we're trying to get it done. And what Billy does is he goes in th through uh, all the events of uh, through LBJ's career and his association with organized crime and, and hands-on eyewitness statements or first, first statements that uh, LBJ about the night before the assassination, uh, on and on and on, the involvement of, uh, like I say, between the organized crime factor and the FBI and the CIA and the Secret Service. Uh, in all honesty, uh, probably the lid's about to blow off this whole thing within the next three years because uh, the information is getting ready to come out. Because you've got, you got eyewitness statements from people that were there or involved in the assassination, but they haven't come to light and come to surface due to the fact that, you know, they're, they're worried about their families, repercussions from the government. But all the figures, all the government figures that were involved at that time have pretty much died or passed on, so everybody's pretty much safe now, so all they're going to do is they're just getting ready to unfold everything. And uh, we're not going to have to wait till 2019 for uh, the rest of the information to be released from the government. We're going to be able to go ahead and go forth. Like I say, within probably, the, I say no later than the next 60 months, the, uh, the information that's getting ready to hit the public is going to basically foretell all that was involved that day. All the way from the changing of the motorcade route before they landed at Love Field, Secret Service driver, uh, why did LBJ get out of the limousine with the president, change places with Governor Connolly in the front limousine, get in the front limousine. He was doing his old buddy a favor, right? got him shot three times and almost got him assassinated. But that's what he told him that day, that he, was, he wanted to do him a favor and him be seen with the President of the United States and almost got him killed. <laughs> so you think that LBJ was primarily the head of it? Or do you think it was well, actually, cooperative? yeah, no, I, I do. In my, in my feelings and the research I've done, uh, LBJ had the most to gain from uh, anyone involved. Now, that's true. Hoover was uh, upset about the way the... Uh, FBI and all the way he was having to answer to Bobby, but that could have that 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 was just business as usual. Really, what they'd done is just got a 
put a leash on Hoover, kept him from uh, doing the things he had been doing. But LBJ had the most to gain. For the simple fact, his, his wife's family, Lady Bird's family, owned a company called Brown Root Construction, which is one of the companies that went over to Vietnam and did most of the intermodal construction, the streets, the bases, uh, the piers, the ports. And also at the same time, his ties to uh, Stockwise to Bell Helicopter, Dow Chemical, and not only that, uh, used to be uh, McDonnell Douglas, which is now LTV out here in Grand Prairie. So you had your three major defense contractors coming right out of the state of Texas. And his ties with them goes all the way back to, like I say, prior to his uh, engagement in politics, which would have been in the 40s, right after World War II. So who had the most to gain? Vietnam conflict cost $220 billion, 59,000 men. Ten years later, uh, LBJ probably benefited and profited roughly in the neighborhood of what? In the billions of dollars. The exact figure can't be quoted really because uh, due to the fact that it's always, there's new information coming up and all the, all the critical parts of it, you know, we really don't go into because it's, it's really null and void at this point because the money was already made and people, we really know who, where it was distributed and which directions it went anyway. And not only that, JFK had told uh, LBJ prior to his uh, re-election he was going to carry a new vice president on the next ticket, 18 months into his term. Reason being, conflicts of interest between LBJ and, and Kennedy on the civil rights issues, uh, Vietnam War addendum. JFK had an addendum to, uh, after he'd gotten out of the, uh, Cuba over the Bay of Pigs issue, he had uh, fired uh, Mr. Cable, which was one of the directors at the time for the CIA over the Bay of Pigs issue. And his brother, Earl Cable, was the mayor of the city of Dallas the day of the assassination. So that makes a pretty picture, too. I mean, if you stop and think about it, you fire my brother, which was over a 20-year man for the CIA, pretty, pretty high up in the organization, and then you come to my town and want to have a motorcade route. All they had to do was, there was, I don't really feel like there was much of a twisting of any arms on the situation. It was pretty much just, here's the key to my city. Uh, do what you want to do. Locate anybody where you want to do it. The involvement goes from, from all the way from the president's office all the way down to city officials here in Dallas, even into the county sheriff's department. So how do you feel that they were able to keep that such a secret? Well, for years and years, uh, like I say, most of the people that had the information would not come forward with it. The only way the Zapruder films ever got out was by a copy that Geraldo Rivera had gotten his hands on. And when he revealed that to the public in 76, that's when a lot of the information started coming out. People started coming forward because they felt more secure about what they were telling and what they were explaining to the public. It opened, actually, what it did was just open the door and letting, well, I mean, they weren't going to assassinate Geraldo Rivera or kill him a car accident or a car wreck. You know, I mean, he was pretty safe from coming out with the video. And at the same time, what that did was basically secured anybody else that came forward with information that they could feel safe about what they were dispelling to the public, too. So... It's been a long deal. We, like I say, we've been at this a long time, and we're still gaining information every day. Just like with Mary Thompson, her statement she gave me uh, four years ago about the assassin in the in the sixth floor window at this end of the building. Uh, due to the, one of the videotapes we have, it shows movement prior to the motorcade coming by, movement all along the sixth floor that day. So there was more. There was probably more than one assassin located on the sixth floor. I feel, I feel, to be honest with you, Oswald had a problem. Governor Connolly was uh, an admiral in the Navy, and he had basically been denying Oswald uh, his uh, benefits and reenlistment in the, federal, in the United States service. So what he had done at that time, Oswald did have a grudge. I'm not going to deny that, but I don't feel like his grudge or his problems was with, was with Kennedy because according to Marina Oswald, his wife, he liked Kennedy. She comes down here every year for the uh, anniversary, and still proclaims her husband's innocence. He actually was a supporter of Kennedy, to be honest with you, but I feel like the reason Oswald actually got involved was due to his aggravation and uh, attitude towards Governor Connolly that day. He saw a chance to make things right for a man that had been messing him over for numerous years due to not allowing him his uh, benefits and everything through the government, not re-enlistment in the service. So maybe at the last minute, 
I feel like he uh, thought second, had second thoughts about it, and left the building. I don't feel like he he was even in the building. According to reports we got, the only only print they have on the gun that was recovered, uh, one of two rifles that were re recovered that day from the sixth floor, uh, the one they show with Oswald that was Oswald's has a 26-hour post-mortem print on it. So it wasn't even it wasn't even a actual print that day. It was after he had been deceased. They went to the morgue, pulled him out, put his print on the butt of that rifle, and claimed that was the gun that he killed him with. Research, different. A lot of the stuff we get, uh, people will talk to us and come to us. Like I say, on our website, we receive over probably uh, 14 to 20 emails a week from just different people coming to us from like, somebody that's been to Dallas and talked to somebody that has our products that we have down here, they may find out from somebody else, no telling where about our website, they come to us with information. And I'm not gonna say that it, they're uh, giving it to us for free, you know, because a lot of it we do acquire, that's why we have copyrights on all our material and everything. But what they'll do is uh, come to us with information if we're interested in it or we think there's a lead there, well, we may go investigate it or we may have them come to Dallas and sit and talk to them or see what they've got to offer us or I mean we've, we've we've even gone back and I had a lady send us an email from Virginia she had pictures of uh, J. Edgar Hoover dressed up in drag and she sent us the email asking us if we'd be interested in purchasing that equipment and I said well that'd be real hard for us to uh, put to the public you know what I'm saying because I really don't think anybody would be interested in purchasing pictures of J. Edgar Hoover dressed in drag so we told her we thought we'd have to in our best interest, it'd be best for us to pass on that. Well, then she ends up sending us the information for free anyway. So we, we, you know, we've got it, we acquired it, but we, you know, like I say, there's we, we've got stuff, documentation, everything that we just we shelve right now because due to the fact, like I say, there's people that are not wanting us to put their stuff, their pictures, or their information in print yet due to the fact that they're worried about their their safety and everything else. But I do believe after. Uh, Billy Solis's book comes out. It's going to open open the doorway to a lot a lot more people coming forward with the with the actual stuff that happened behind the scenes, not the assassination itself exactly that day, because everybody pretty much knows what happened that day, who the assassins were and everything, where they were located at, and the, where the shots came from. But what I'm reflecting on is what I'm working on is where we're trying to piece it and put it together prior to the assassination, so we can start finger finger pointing and printing and put down who actually was involved in the assassination to the to the limit. So just for the record, where do you think the shooters were? Well, there were two shell casings recovered off your records building on the roof. You also have eyewitness statements where a shooter was located over here on the second floor of the old Daltex building. And then I explained about Mary Thompson's statement where the shooter was on the sixth floor at that end of the building, opposite end of the building where Oswald was supposed to have been. And then you have your the badge man, Mac Wallace, who was located and detained down behind the uh, fence line, he was also associated with LBJ in organized crime deals. He was, uh, excuse me, detained and questioned by officers and then released and let go because he had on Dallas cop uniform and badge and they let him go. And then you had an additional shooter which was in the front part of the fence on your upper pergola, which we feel is where the throat shot came from. And then also you have your assassin that was located on across Dealey Plaza over there uh, is the shot that got Governor Connolly, probably the one that got him in the wrist because the bullet entered from the left and exited to the right. If he'd been shot along this side of Dealey Plaza, he'd have had to have been shot from the right exiting to the left. And the wound wasn't inflicted that way, which puts your shooter across the way over there on, on the other side of uh, the upper pergola. So all in all, there were probably located that day probably nine nine different shots. Uh, variably, I we know six assassins that were located here that day, and probably I figure probably one or two more. And it's even been reported that um, Woody Harrelson's father was one of the uh, FRR guys that was the Freedom Rail Riders that was detained that day out there on the. Uh, on the railway, and he's now doing a 30-year sentence in Texas prisons for murder. So there's there's situation there. There's information that we're still trying to get a hold of and talk to. What did they see that 
back there that day and so on and so forth. Can you tell me again when you say we, what your organization is and the website? Frontier Productions. And New Frontier Productions. Website jfkassassination.com. Right here in Dallas, Texas. And uh, as far as you know, with LBJ, a lot of people would probably ask, um, why did he not run again if he went through all that trouble to get presidency? Well, actually, he did. He did serve two terms. He served the term where he finished out for Kennedy, and he served the additional term before Nixon was elected as president. Right, but then he refused to go he, again. He exactly. Thought. Well, at that time, what had happened? You had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy come up. So you had the involvement of who? LBJ, J. Edgar Hoover, FBI, organized crime, the whole scenario all over again. He didn't want to, he didn't want to go through that again. He'd already been through the Warren Commission once, which he actually set up the Warren Commission to start with. But he didn't want to go through all that again because basically, in my opinion, the bad publicity and people would people were really already starting to wonder about the whole assassination theory anyway. I mean, a bullet, one pristine bullet doing a 45 degree turn going in and coming out and going, I mean, one bullet making three holes in two different men, you know what I'm saying? That's impossible. But that was the theory that they had stuck with and that's the one they presented to the public for so many years until all the information started coming out. And I just don't feel like LBJ wanted to go through any more of the criticism and the ridicule that he was already feeling. And not only that, he done made his money. He had plenty of money. He didn't need, he didn't need politics any longer. I mean, when he came back to Texas, what did he do? He retired and stayed on his ranch. Which Lady Bird, she's still alive. And I, I've been informed that upon her death, she's 91, but upon her death, there's gonna be even some people that are going to come forward and explain a few things about the involvement of LBJ and a few other items too. So it's just out of respect for her right now that a lot of these people hadn't come forward that were involved. So it's all getting ready to come together. Like I say, it's getting ready, the lid's getting ready to blow plum off of it. Um, let's talk about the area. Okay. Uh, how long have you been coming out here? Uh, I've been coming out here since 1966, 67, I guess. Uh, working with research out here, probably, like I say, off and on the past seven years. So, does this place still give you any kind of particular feeling, or, I mean... Well, actually, one of, one of disgust, disappointment, in uh, what I was actually raised to think and feel about the country I live in, that a few people, what would you call it, a few bad apples in the barrel can ruin the whole situation. And that's a lot of times when I'm out here in the evenings, uh, I've been out here at night doing, uh, taking shots and everything. And after, after 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, it, it's kind of kind of eerie out here. You know, it's, it's dead quiet. There's no traffic. And it's like sometimes you can just stand here and reflect and, and see in your mind the rerouted of the motorcade that day when it was rerouted and uh, actually look in the windows and, you know, kind of like, Depends on how much imagination you got, I guess, in one aspect. But uh, it's kind of eerie sometimes. It really is. I used to come down here by myself sometimes, but I don't really do that too much anymore. I always come with someone else now because it's kind of weird. There's, I mean, it's... I don't know if you... Uh, depends upon your religious and your spiritual beliefs, but uh, I do feel that there are unrested souls still sometimes that uh, out of the, all the people that were assassinated and killed due to their statements and their uh, information to the federal government, I, I wouldn't say that there's not some of those people spiritually probably roaming around here two or three o'clock in the morning, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, just, it's a weird feeling down here at night. <laughs> um, have you ever gone over, you ever over to the Kennedy Memorial? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Disappointment. Why is that? Uh, I feel bad about it because, uh, I actually, I know the guy Brian Dealey, he's the uh, fifth, let's see, he's fifth dec decade or fifth generation descendant of, of, of Bob Dealey, the origin or the founder of Dallas, Texas. And his family still owns uh, the property at the log cabin, the, the first log cabin in Dallas and the memorial property. They own that property still. Those are his, his, his lots. 
and just to know the people that are involved in the uh, stuff. I mean, in my opinion, I think it was a real disgrace to uh, the Kennedy family for what they did. The park, what the, the, the area behind the old courthouse used to just be like an open uh, park area and it was full of winos and drug addicts and homeless people and they decided to clean it all out and clean it up and put his memorial back there, which basically is uh, over two blocks away from where the actual assassination took place. And if you go out here, the only thing that they mark the actual assassination with is, a, is a, probably a, a 13 by 11 inch plaque down there in the ground right by the curb. And that's in memory of. So it's, it's a real disappointment really. In my opinion, what they should have done was either put a, a 24 hour flaming torch out here or either erected some kind of, of monument to him right here on the plaza to uh, commemorate each year, you know, his death and his assassination. But the city of Dallas don't want to do that because uh, for them, still to this day, the assassination is like an eyesore, something that won't go away that they wish they'd never been involved in. But then again, you have to understand, back at that time, it, our, my fathers and grandfathers, those people weren't really involved uh, in the decisions that were made for the city at the time, you know, so between the federal government and the city officials here and uh, FBI and all the involvement of the assassination, the American people weren't even thought of at all anyway. I mean, it was just a bad, bad situation all the way around for everybody. Our country, our city, our state. Let me, uh, let me turn okay. Telling me. <laughs> oh. Just uh, you can just tell me about what's different about what you do and some of the other people out here doing some of the bogus information. Well, it's really not, it's not actually bogus information. It's put together by, uh, well, one histor historical association has a publication out here. And then um, Robert Groden, he does, he, 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 he puts his information out here too. But at the same time, a lot of that, uh, the information they can be put into the public is one thing, but the people that they've got representing their product out here on the, on the streets, the vendors, they quote unquote are called uh, are just basically derelicts, uh, people that are smoking crack, getting drunk, staying drunk, talking to the tourists, and they'll tell them they'll tell them anything. I mean, whatever it takes to put that five dollars in their pocket for that paper, they're going to tell them what they want to hear because they're just they're just feeding off the tourists wanting to know the knowledge, and it's like a, a, a child trying to acquire information, you, you know, the wrong person's in control, that person, that person will walk away believing that they've got it, the correct information, all they've got is a head full of lies. So that's a, that's a lot of trouble we have out here right now is we're trying to uh, basically, quote unquote, dispel to the public that not all these guys out here you talk to know what they're talking about because they're going to tell you anything because that's all they're out here for is to make their money and go like back. Oh well, I've I've had a guy say that he he was he's only uh, 27 years old, one of the vendors, and he said he was he was up there beside Jack Ruby the day he died, and he wasn't even he wasn't even born then. And then another thing I've heard him say is that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was shot over here in this uh, garage by the old county court old county jail, and he was killed on the, at the municipal courts building on the other end of town in the in the underground garage. Uh, they'll like I said, they'll tell you anything to. Uh, Put that five dollars in their pocket. Um, have you gone over the conspiracy museum? Correct. Yes. Yeah, you know the person. Mm-hmm. Right. Ron think, Rice. What do you think of that? Of Ron? Wait, of, uh, Ron's museum. of the museum itself. Uh, I feel more comfortable in referring people 
that want to know the true facts and the information of what happened that day to that museum than I do have in sending them to the federally funded county museum or the Sixth Floor Museum. Reason being, uh, they're going to show you the actual, on the audio deal over here, they're going to show you, they're going to run you up on your Zapruder films right before the fatal headshot, and then they're going to stop the film there because, quote unquote, they're still the federal government and they're funded, they're county office, county function, but they're, fed, they're funded by the federal government, the Parks and Recreation Board. So they're getting their money from the federal government. They can't come in here and tell you that Oswald didn't kill JFK because that would affect their funding. So what they're going to tell you is just what they've got to tell you to keep their funding coming in so they can keep operating. Which I'm not going to say that's wrong because still to this day, I'll talk to people out here on the street and they'll, they'll argue till they're blue in the face that Oswald was the one that killed JFK. And you know, it's, it's each and every man's own opinion on how they uh, feel about the events of that day. But myself, over the years, I started out thinking that it was the Oswald theory also. But after all the facts and the information and the things that have dispelled that and the information we've acquired over the years, I know a different story now. Let me just check the time on this tape because I don't know sure how much you have on there. What, at what point did you change? Was there a particular thing that you read or saw? No, just actually a, basically an overview. Uh, and I started really thinking about what I was actually researching. I mean, the stuff that came out about Oswald, uh, his medical records that had disputed all the federal government had put out, the information they tried to dispel the public, and then um, roughly uh, just basically the overview of the whole story. Just, just kept, everything just kept discrediting the federal government. One, one story to the next, you know, one eyewitness statement to the next. Uh, all the mysterious deaths of the, of the witnesses, you know, I mean, how did that many people die of, of strange accidents? I mean, you're, the, the guy that operated the train track station back here died of a brand new, he's driving a brand new car that uh, suffers brake failure, and crashes into a wall at 65 miles an hour, he's killed. I mean, the things just started, didn't add up. Too mysterious, too much mystery behind all of it. And then when you start unveiling, it's kind of like taking the, uh, how do you say it, uh, the covers off your eyes and start seeing the truth for what it is. I mean, back in the 60s, we just come out of the Korean conflict. Everybody was pretty much behind the way uh, Truman and Eisenhower carried our country after FDR. And people were convinced that our country was the greatest in the world, which it still probably is one of the most powerful in the world. I'm not going to say it's the greatest in the world, but it is actually one of the most powerful. So then you have people that grew up back in that time. That's all they knew how to think, and that's the way they were basically, uh, what do we call it today, subliminal messages, trained to uh, think that the federal government was correct in anything and everything they did. But you have to look at your leaders you had then. FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, those were respectable "Quote unquote," God-fearing people that did the did the right job, you know, did the right thing, and then we had a uh, JFK come into office, and uh, "quote unquote," I feel like he would if if he hadn't been assassinated, our country wouldn't be where it is today. I think we'd I think we'd gone a different direction. He had foresaw uh, space flight. He he was working, uh, going to go into working on uh, putting some a man on the moon. He had all those ideals, quote unquote, in perspective. And if you look at it, the civil rights issues even got plumb out of hand after, after LBJ had taken over an office. I mean, you had problems with your rights, you had all the civil rights issues that were being denied and things were still going on the way they were going for hundreds of years and nothing had changed. But JFK put pressure not only on your uh, federal government but along your southern belt for the change was coming and it was going to be done soon. It, he wasn't going to he wasn't going to mess around or put it off. He was coming in to take charge and change the way America was at that time. Let me just uh, change this tape because there wasn't that much left on it when I started. If you talk to got a job like anybody else, you know what I'm saying? He's director of the museum and everything. What is it that you like about him? 
Uh, well, he's a he's he's just a hands-on. He's real. Actually, he's just a nice guy. To be honest with you, I got a lot of respect for him. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he might not tell you that there was a conspiracy on the, off the record, too. You know what I'm saying? You, you, just, you never know. Every, like I say, everybody's got their own theory about what happened that day. And I don't really deal with theory anymore. What I deal with now is facts. And that's what I go by. Uh, were you in town when Oliver Stone came to town? Was filming? Yes. Did you go to any of this? Yeah, we, we viewed the whole... The whole well, it was about, it took about a, uh, well, I was here for about a week of it, actually. Can you describe some of it? Uh, Hollywood. <laughs> just making a movie. I mean, they just do it over and over again. Over and over and over. Just like when BBC was down here last week and they were doing their filming for their documentary. You know, they were doing the motorcade route. But it was real, it's kind of sad in a way because uh, you have people coming here to do documentaries and they're not even actually going through the actual process of what actually happened that day just like with the BBC they had one they had the uh, they didn't even have actually the limousine it was just a uh, a Lincoln with suicide doors on it four door and uh, they had JFK or looked like JFK and uh, Jacqueline in the back seat uh, one motorcycle cop and one uh, limousine in front of that and that was it but the lady they explained to us oh it doesn't matter about what's going on out here when we get back to the studio you know how it is we 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 cut and splice and put it all together where you won't even be able to tell what was filmed out here. And I said, well, that's, that's kind of like a line to the public in it. You know what I'm saying? You're not actually doing a full reenactment of what happened that day, There's, but that's what they claim, you know. And that's what, that's what really makes me sad about a lot of the stuff that goes on out here. Because they're not, they're not doing what actually happened. What they're doing is what they want to present, which I guess that's what they're getting paid for, the directors that do the films and everything. So. That's what, what did you think of what Oliver Stone presented? Cl probably closer to the truth and closer to the facts that were uncovered by Jim Garrison, uh, the district attorney out of uh, Louisiana, than anything else that's been documented or shown as far as a quote-unquote movie. <laughs> Told more of the truth about the actual assassination. A lot of the films you see on JFK or the Kennedy Family, uh, all it does is they'll go, they'll take you through uh, most of it to the uh, election process and all that, but they really don't go into the assassination process because at the time those films were made, a lot of them, the information we have today wasn't even around. So they, there was a touch and go type thing and too touchy, they didn't want to mess with it because it would have hurt their, their sales or whatever they had coming out on film. So they basically pretty much just tried to avoid it other than actual, you know, saying, He'd been assassinated, da 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 da, and then going into the burial ceremony and all when they got back to Washington, you know. But Oliver Stone did go through with what I, what I consider probably the, the closest thing so far that's come out to what actually happened. Is there anything particular where you think he was too Hollywood? Well, no, not really. He was. It was pretty factual. A lot of it. But you know, at the same time, the assassination attempt that uh, Jim Garrison actually unfolded and started working on was the assassination attempt that was supposed to have taken place in Houston the next day. It just got messed up. And in the process, the people that were involved in it had started, had been, uh, their covers had been, bl been blown and they were being uh, found out about. So everything just got taken over by, quote unquote, uh, different people, which in this case would have been uh, probably combination J. Edgar Hoover and LBJ, and moved to a different location and upgraded in time to where it happened in Dallas the day before. So, so when was it originally scheduled? I, I feel that uh, according to what Jim Garrison was uncovering, the actual assassination tip was to have taken place in Houston the, the next day, which would have been after Dallas. That was the original, from what we're finding out, was the original day that they were supposed to have done it. Would have been in Houston, not in Dallas. So, But, like I say, when they started, people that were involved, started, information started leaking out and the direction it was going started being uncovered, they had to do something because uh, President Kennedy was going to die in Texas one way or the other. 
he wasn't leaving Texas without being in a coffin. So why didn't they kill him the morning over in Fort Worth when he was over there at the convention center and all? I don't know. They waited till they got to Dallas and had everything in, low, in position and it went all the way through. Like on the Zapruder films, you can see the umbrella man. We did a, I, did, I worked with a guy from uh, Channel 8 News. We did a documentary about two months ago on the umbrella man. And the information we've uncovered is in the military, you always have two types of signals. First is your audio, second is your visual in time of conflict, in other words, in battle. You'll have your initial startup engagement, which is, which is audio. And then once battle has begun, you'll have your initial commencement, which is visual. Well, the Umbrella Man had repositioned himself as the motorcade started coming towards Elm Street from the upper pergola all the way down to right by the light pole where he's caught in the corner of the Zapruder films with the umbrella open right before the fatal headshots inflicted on President Kennedy. So there you have it. You're going from uh, audio, which would have been your first initial shots from the, from the back that hadn't killed him yet. He was still alive. So they went to the second step, which was your visual commencement of the additional shots from back up here on the upper pergola. We just uncovered that. We worked on that probably, like I said, we're, we've been in the process of working on that for the last 18 months, I guess. Information, eyewitness statements where he was positioned and had relocated himself. And then after the assassination, they never questioned or detained anyone with an umbrella. And there were theories that the, there was a gun in the umbrella. And, or the guy was in the, underneath the drain, the manhole out there, and he shot him. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you usually refer people to the conspiracy when you see them more. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, I mean, did you go to the Sixth Farm Museum when it first opened, or when did you go? I've been up there, it was a long time ago, probably about, I guess right after it first opened, a year or two. And uh, I was really disappointed in it because, uh, the main thing I thought was uh, when I got up there, I'd be able to visually look out the window and see what actually Oswald was supposed to have seen that day. Well, they've got it fenced off where you can't even get close to the window. All you do is see the box sitting there and a the rifle sitting there, and you don't even get to look out the window. Now, that that kind of disappointed me about that, but at the same time, food for thought. If Oswald had been in that window, when that motorcade turned and came down Houston Street, He's got a direct shot of less than, what, uh, 70 yards for the initial impact of one shot, fatal head shot right to the head. Why did the motorcade have to turn, turn left here on Elm Street and the president get shot three to four different times before he was finally assassinated? Because he wasn't ever there. So you don't think anybody was at this corner? Not this corner. No. Sixth floor, that window down there on the end, we know from an eyewitness statement that she heard a shot and saw President Kennedy go forward, looked up to the window and saw the assassin in that window. But within about probably, uh, probably a matter of uh, four sec well, three and a half, four seconds, there were, were, were at least four shots fired that we can count, account for on our videotapes and our DVDs and stuff that we put together. So which is a compilation of over 100 films that we've acquired over the years and everything, so. Well, I do want to interview this band. I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'll just ask you, what do you think the future of the plaza is? Do you think people are going to continue to come here for the next Oh, year? well, what I'm, what I'm hoping happens is that they'll finally, it's in the uh, register as being a historical site, but it's technically, quote, unquote, not registered as a historical site. So therefore, you have, that's why you have all these people out here, these idiots, trying to sell you anything and everything to make money off of you because if it had any kind of control over it, which would be if it was registered as a national historical site, the federal government would come in here and put up stipulations and regulations and everything would quote unquote operate the way it should, you know what I'm saying? But it's not listed that way. It's listed that way, but it's actually not put that way. I mean, it's not carried that way. It's not funded or anything. So I'm hoping to see that happen. And at the same time, make some kind of uh, other memorial or some, some kind of remembrance out here besides just a plaque in the ground down there across from the X where the fatal headshot was. But do you think it's going to be meaningful to people 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this will be, this will be probably one of the, well, people are still curious about Bonnie and Clyde, right? So 
That's all I can tell you. The saga never ends. All right. Thank you. All right. Wait a minute. Hang on. I'll go up here.